everyone, and welcome to Greater Baltimore Urban League Student Light Kickback Session on Police Reform. My name is Lacey Reddit, and I'm an 11th grader at Baltimore City College. Hey everyone, my name is Omani. I'm also an 11th grader at Baltimore City College. Welcome to the conversation. Hi, my name is Joshua Wilson. I am also an 11th grader at Baltimore City College, and welcome back to the kickback. Hello, my name is Jocelyn. I'm a 12th grader and I go to the Baltimore Polytechnic Institute. Welcome. We have Baltimore City State Attorney, Marilyn Mosby, member of the Maryland House of Delegates, Nick Mosby, and retired Chief Melvin Russell. Also, we have Divine B. There are a lot of things to discuss in review, so let's get into the kickback. Yeah, let's just get started. So what do you guys think should be done with these $22 million that were cut from the police budget? Why? Well, I'll jump in there real quick. So I know like from a media perspective uh, and even from um, like information that's come out of the council, they you, they've, they said it's $22 million. It's really not $22 million um, because it's not $22 million in hard money. Um, a majority, a large majority of the money uh, that they cut are existing programs that are grant funded programs from places like the state. So that money will basically go back to the state because the original intention for the money uh, is not um, is not being had because they cut that program. So they have to send that money back. So it's about eight million dollars, I believe, that's left over. Uh, and I think that um, it's when we talk about reallocation of funding, one of the main problems uh, that kind of goes to the police department um, is when you talk about um, mental health illness, when you talk about homelessness, when you talk about them interacting um, uh, with populations in the public of things that they're not necessarily subject matter experts on. So, you know, I would look to try to redirect that money uh, to other services. Um, but it, again, it's not 22, it's more like eight. And so he's a technical guy. He knows all of that. The technicalities of the money and the allocation, which is he'll soon be the Baltimore City so he's charged with knowing all of that. One thing I can say in this particular moment um, in our country's history where people are calling on police accountability reform is that we really need to kind of reimagine, use this time to go from protest to actual policy and reimagine what policing is in this country. But far too long, we have relied on police departments to respond to every social ill of society. And as Nick already indicated, we have them respond to mental you know, that's not their expertise. And so I think what should be happening, and I know there's a lot of talk around defunding or divesting funds, is that there should be a reinvestment into those services um, that that, do, are, that people specialize, right? They, they have the expertise to be able to respond to them. And also reinvesting into communities. So trying to break that school to prison pipeline and ensuring that you're investing in young people like yourself in job training, um, you know, youth opportunities, recreational opportunities. And so I think this time is really, really important because we have to really move from that policy, I mean, from, from protest to actual policy, and now's the time to do it. Yeah. I think. Um, you got it. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think with that being said, um, well, I want to thank you for informing us that it isn't as much as what's being broadcast on the media. But um, with the thought still in mind that it is still a lot of money, I think that the money could go into the school system and um, renovations for its buildings and adding heat and air into the buildings. I think that it can go back into organizations that help with youth in the city. Um I think it can go into preparations for reopening schools if they do reopen in January. And um, I, I do agree with what you said, investing into the um, programs that police often um, have to, the, the things that they normally do, the people who are supposed to do them, I think those programs should get money too. Josh, what were you gonna say? Uh, pretty much what you were saying. Um, I think that, with the money that is still out there 
it could be really beneficial to students if that money were put into school repairs and like making sure that when we do go back into the school buildings, we have things like hand soap and toilet paper because we didn't have those before, you know, the entire pandemic. And now if we're expected to go back in person, that sanitary equipment and things like masks and hand sanitizer are gonna be even more important. I think that also a good use of the money could be, you know, investing like that $8 million in creating like rec centers and, you know, just things to occupy like people when they're outside of like school or work to make sure that like, you know, there's less going on and like less chance of like, you know, any like crimes or anything being committed that, you know, would maybe not require as much community policing. Uh, I'm going to pass it to Jocelyn. What do you think? I definitely agree. And I would also like to say, I feel as though a lot of that money would be useful, like you said, towards in our schools. I feel as though a lot of this money could be given back to our community, focusing on building people up um, and to a lot of programs, helping children get off the street, you know, doing better and helping other people. And also even like giving the money and transferring it to like HBCU scholarships because they don't even have the enough money to fund and give enough scholarships compared to PWI. So that could be a good, you know, I guess upgrade with helping scholarships, ha helping um, young African American students get into the education that they would want to help them provide for their future. Um, and um, also for it's like the money could go into, like you guys also mentioned, the hybrid school year as if they're like trying because you know we need um a lot more work within our schools and just even with like making sure there's nece the necessary um sanitation is met and even before that with like the ac we are known to have several days in out of each school year just because of ac problems of it being too hot or it not being cold enough for students and i feel like that would just be like a great uplifted thing for like our city Any input, Lacey? Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, there's also a lot of things where it's like donations go into that too. Like, I, I'm always getting calls on my phone like, can you donate to the police department? And different things like that. There are also like times where schools, um, they get donations from like other people, like other things too. So it may be like one school, like let's just take BSA for example. Like, you know, you always hear on the news that they're constantly getting um, donations and things like that. So you, so when you go into BSA, it's going to look totally different from when you go to city, whereas the walls are cracking and the ceilings are falling. Like, those are it's totally different things. And the fact that we just got a grant this past school year to finally get air in school and fix up the building, is cr that's bizarre <laughs> to me why I have to, well, we get out at least probably in total two weeks because we don't have air like that's absurd like you want us to sweat in school that that's bizarre to me any anyone else want to have input i do i actually agree with jocelyn when she said that we should think about the community but i don't think that we should forget about um certain parts of the community i think we should be thinking about everybody including the lgbt community because I know one thing, especially in Baltimore City, domestic violence to trans women and people are part of the LGBT community in general is something big out here. There's a lot of trans people dying every day, almost like, like it's crazy. I'm someone that has been beat by 10 boys for just walking down the street being myself. I feel like we should focus on things to put laws in place and other situations and places that people can go for, um, trans people and LGBT community. I feel like we should be refining the safe harbor law. I also feel like that we should be putting money into programs like the Pride Center of Maryland. We should be supporting um, the Baltimore Safe Haven. Um, I'm not sure if you guys know what the Baltimore Safe Haven is, but we actually just made Times Magazine for a march that we did here for Black, Lives Trans Black Trans Lives Matter. We painted it on 
Charles Street in Mount Vernon, not Mount Vernon, I'm sorry, Charles Village. But I feel like we should be supporting and funding programs like that to make sure that people out here who are participating in survival sex work or people who are living on the streets, people who can't go home because their parents don't accept them. I feel like we should be giving them homes. We should be figuring out how to give them money. We should be figuring out how to support them with food and put them in places where they can, where they can survive and be successful like the rest of the, the world, the rest of the community. Yeah. Yeah, 100% agree with what you're saying. Uh, Chief Russell, what do you think? What are you thinking? Yeah, again, all of you have made, just like everyone said, you've made incredible points. Um, and I'm grateful for my great friend, um, the Mosby's, and for um, Delegate Nick letting us know that even though we say 22 million has been defunded from the police department, it's really um, more like eight, and that's really going back to the state. So um, everything that you guys talked about, supporting some things that we would love to see um, um, supported in Baltimore are absolutely true from homelessness, to LGBTQ, you talk about LGBTQ, you know, when, when I was a chief there, one of my sergeants who was an LGBTQ member, uh, community member, literally scoured the nation for best practices to make and render community safe for our, for our members of LGBTQ. And he literally bought back from Seattle, tailor made it and started those safe havens um, for those members. So I, I applaud him. Uh, he didn't get a whole lot of, re, uh, um, what do I say? Um, support but he started those right in baltimore getting businesses to open up to make them safe havens um, but there's a lot of things that we could be doing um i, I don't like to say defund but reallocating because i'm a i'm a firm believer and always been a firm believer especially being a former member of baltimore police department having the largest budget of any city agency um grand we're the largest but still you know you talk about a half a billion dollars dated and we should be helping our partners because we're all about servicing the community, right? And so when you talk about the homelessness, that's part of our concerns. So we should be ending up monies from our half a billion dollar fund to help those homeless. We should be doing that for domestic violence. Um, it, it's kind of crazy, and I'll say this and then I'll shut up on this point. Um, you know, um, the, the Mosley's know I was the community chief there, and I was the only chief of six or seven chiefs there that didn't have an operation budget. And so for all the things that we wanted to do and everything we wanted to do was based around preventive measures, right? So it wasn't about enforcement, 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 but how do we make our community better by coming through a different way and preventing crime? How do we make and enhance our communities to enhance um, the lifestyles of individuals in our communities and make those communities safer? So we were doing things like putting our police officers in schools, um, not for protection, but to help teach them and help mentor them, officer friendly, i.e. We were building out camps to for our at-risk students who weren't going to school or were being bullies in school because of social economic underlying issues that nobody really was paying attention to. Um, we were doing all these various things, um, and there's too many to name here, but the key thing is we had no money to do those things. So we had to get our funding from the private sector. We had to get it from um, nonprofits. We had to get it from churches. We had to get it from businesses. We had to get it from our residents to build out and service our community when instead we should have been able to tap into some of that funding, millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that BPD has sat on, but never wanted to partner with the community in such a way that we physically put skin in the game, if that makes sense. So there's a lot more we could be doing and a lot more that I hope we see, not just Baltimore police, but all of us come together and make a coalition to make our city better. Yeah, um, I wanna go back on something that you did say about defunding versus reallocating. So I guess that leads me into a question of, and this is for everyone, what does defunding the police mean to you? So I, I guess by being the only police chief on here, I certainly wanna hear from my great friends the Mosby's. Um, so my definition of, first of all, let me say it this way. Again, I have been a huge advocate of reallocating some of BPD's large budget. As, as a matter of fact, I say all police departments across the nation in general should be making sure that some of their funds are reallocated to help their communities be better. Um, I believe that most of my career. So my definition of reallocating some of the police funds would be the same as what I think many of you and many people out there are calling when they say we want defunding. 
Um, my understanding is, if I'm right, defunding the police says divest or take away some funds from the police department and then reallocate them to non-zero tolerance postmodern policing forms of public safety and community support via community services, housing. And I, I've heard everybody say, um, but police not in that field. But, you know, we should be all things to all people because we come in contact like no other agency with all people for all issues. And so some of our funding should be going towards, in partnership with our partners, some of it should be going to make better health care accessible to our community members, community mediation, um, so, social, will, social, social worker skill set, thank you, should be part of the police language. And they can't do that by themselves, so we should be tapping into our community members and social workers to help us do that, right? Listen, we've been fighting for years and years and years of how to make our communities better, but we've gotten away from the service piece and we only want to do the enforcement piece. And so I think that's when you started seeing the monies that police sit on no longer being reallocated. That's why you could point to and say things like, what happened to PAL centers, right? What happened to officer friendly programs? What happened to all those feel good um, entities that came out of the police department, but wasn't them solely, but them partnering with community members, anything from helping people coming back out of jail and reallocate themselves back into society properly. What happened to all those programs or what's wrong with building out those programs with our community partners and nonprofit organizations? Um, I just think it's one and the same when we say defund and we say reallocating. I just think it's important to say defund now because nothing's being reallocated from the money that's being sat on. And so since you don't want to reallocate it, then you know what? We'll do it for you. And that's where defunding comes in place. That's my that's my two cents on it. That's my perception of it. I pretty much agree with everything that you just said. Um, the police currently are sitting on about five hundred twenty seven point ninety six million dollars. And like as a department, like, I believe that's the second highest funded department in the entire city, only second to public works, which has about $7 million. So I think that when it comes to like, you know, defunding the police, reallocating their you know, funds, for me, I see that as, you know, why don't we take about let's just say like a rough number 200 million dollars from that and put it into the communities put it into the schools put it into like the rec centers the homes like fixing up you know these abandoned houses and like these broken down homes and you know just seeing how the community grows and if the need for community policing goes down so does anyone else want to jump in on that one I mean, J Joshua, you're right. I mean, again, Marilyn's going to say this is a technical answer, but I mean, when you look at when you look at um, inflation, which is basically the value of money, and you map that out for the past like 30, 40 years, um, police spending in Baltimore City, like many other urban areas, have outperformed inflation. Meaning, we're spending more today with the dollar that we have today than we did say 20, 30, 40 years ago. It's a fact. Now, when you look at comparative services, say like recs and parks, right, which is really important for youth development in our city, we are we've spent less, we've underperformed the inflation curve, meaning we're spending less today than we were 20, 30, 40 years ago. So with all of the complexities of issues that you have in a city like Baltimore, we're literally telling our young folks that we expect them to perform, do well, be great. Um, and deal with all the issues that government has created. However, we're spending less, we're investing less, and we're pouring less into you, right? That's a failed equation. Uh, and I think the whole theory behind defund is we can continue to chase our, chase our tails. So we can continue to act as if we're creating environments and situations for our communities to thrive. And then when we're not, we're gonna plaster you on the six o'clock news, on the front page of the paper, and oh, by the way, we need to spend more, 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 more on law enforcement. Uh, so I guess, the, again, the theory behind defund is like, hey, we need to develop a way of eradicating uh, the, the situation by investing in the things that we know make our communities healthy, uh, safer, 
uh, and that drive a better city. And to capitalize off of the moment, I don't know if you guys can hear me, we were having some technical difficulties before, but to capitalize off of this moment, it's time to reimagine policing in this country. And so, yes, reinvesting, divesting, uh, however you want to say it, you know, taking some, reallocating resources and investing in young people so that we can break that school to prison pipeline is incredibly, incredibly important. Put it into services and education in your schools. Like let's do all the front end stuff so that we're not we're not dealing with the back end stuff and, and you're now in a courtroom and behind bars, right? Like that, let's make that investment on the front end as we've already articulated. Yeah, um if I may if I may if I may you can go, go. You, you talk to me now Yes, you can go. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for being rude. But I, I just want to co-sign um, with Marilyn and Nick is saying, especially Nick, if you paid attention to what he was saying, he talked about how policing funding has outpaced far as growth than, than uh, programs. I shouldn't even call them programs, but other entities that are just as important, if not more important. We know crime fighting is important, but so is educating our youth, right? And so how in the world can one outpace the other, right? And then think about this. He said 20, 30 years ago, probably we can even go back further. If you go back in time, policing was a lot more successful and then better partnerships, had better relationships, better community trust back then. Look at this with less money proportionally and um, more cops, less money, more cops, less toys, less money. But we were more effective. And I think the key component there was we weren't separate from the community. So everything Merlin talked about, everything Nick talked about, and everything you guys talked about, we weren't exclusive. I saw that it wasn't our lanes. We were part of all those venues that were flowing in our community. So we were part of making sure our kids um, were staying safe and mentoring them. We were in our schools. We had also program, friendly programs in our school system, right? And so you can go down the caveat of things and say, well, there wasn't much that was going on in our city that you didn't see the police that had a hand into it because at that time they were truly community partners in everything as opposed to now, only time you see them is when they come in as occupiers. I think it's a huge difference and all we've done over the last couple of decades is feed that beast and said, you know what, even though we didn't mean this, we said it's okay not to service anymore, just keep protecting us. And then that got so aggressive, we are where we are today with the protesting, with the police shootings and everything else. So um, I, I think what the Mosby has said, the Mosby's, uh, they're my favorite power couple, first of all. Everybody should know that, my favorite power couple. Um, I think what they said absolutely makes sense and we need to pay attention to what they're saying. I think to add on to um, Marilyn Mosby and you as well, Chief, um, I remember when there was officer friendly, um, specifically at my middle school, and I think that that takes um, a big part of reimagining the police and educating the youth to have those programs back in middle and elementary schools to not just have the police there to um, secure the environment, but to educate youth on what the police are doing there and their jobs. And so it's not just an I'll say negative um, view on the police overall, because I do think that those programs who they used to be around were definitely beneficial. Um, Josh, is there anything you wanted to say? So the one, can I jump in here? And I was gonna just say, Imani, you brought up some really great points. Um, and that's one of the things that we attempted to do at, out of my office. But when you talk about reallocating funds, right? So we have in my office, we have a junior state attorney program where every year we take, um, for the summer, for six weeks, we take young people like yourself in the ninth and 10th grade, they partner with the Mayor's Office of Employment Development, we start in the beginning of the night on call center, and this is from Fox Trot Federal Circuit District Court. And they do, at the culmination of those six weeks, right, they do a mock trial competition at the University of Baltimore School of Law where they can see themselves as judges and prosecutors and police. Right, but because of the resources, and we're limited and restricted, and, and, and 
the number of people that we can bring into the program. But if you invest dollars into something like that, so it's more on a broader scale, we've been able to touch more than 260 young people through the course of five years. But imagine if you were investing in that type of program for the police department and for my office, right? And you did this collaboratively, we could do it on a, a mass scale where it's not just 260 young people, but a, a whole lot more. Yeah, uh, anyone else want to? Um, definitely. I can, like, I have personal insight on what you were saying. Um, because my sister was a part of um, JSA, and my father is ex, well, he's retired now, but he was a part of Baltimore City Fire Department. So I know what it's like for people in my family to be, like, rooted into the city that way. And I was just talking about him, I think, yesterday. He was saying how underfunded the fire department is versus the police department and how like the fire department has to share their commissions and things with the city and other programs where the police department is just like one thing, like that's what they get. So I um so I understand really like what it's like, especially going from a school that well, because we were we were a charter school, we were still kind of a part of um, Baltimore City Public Schools. I know what it's like for for my school, including, well, Dr. Santelis's daughters went to that school. So I know what it's like for a school to be well taken care of with having less funding versus going to a bigger school with quote unquote more funding and for, fun, and for the school to look worse. But I just want, like, I guess that's kind of a question like, how do schools like get funding? I know some of it is through grants and things like that, but like overall, like does it depend on how many students are in your school or? You cut out. Lacey, I think the last part of your question um, cut out. If you could restate your question, that would be. Uh, she dipped out. I think that what she was asking was how does what determines what schools get, you know, how much funding? Like, is, is it based on grants or is it like every school gets the exact same amount? Like, how is that determined? So in, in Maryland, um, we have a per pupil funding system. So um, that's how the state, there's a state funding formula uh, and there'll be different weights depending on um, the type of population, like the free and reduced lunch population, but basically it's on a per pupil basis. So um, proportionally, each school gets the same amount of funding. Now, under two um, school CEOs ago, um, uh, there was a strategy to provide the principals with more autonomy over their school budget uh, and work directly with the community on establishing how the school budget, how the school individually allocated some of those resources. Uh, so in certain schools, sometimes uh, maybe they're pinching off money to have an art teacher, maybe pinching off money to have uh, this particular after school program. Um, but it's those um, level of things that are kind of flexible. But again, proportionally based off of the per pupil funding, uh, all schools receive this. As a so, new I mean, again, real quick, so a larger school with more students mm -hmm. is going to have a larger pot of money um, because it's a perfect basis. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. As a new nonprofit with a focus on childhood trauma and family wholeness, what can we do in partnership with the police to benefit the youth? So let me let me take a crack at this, Josh. So. One of the things that we did is a little known secret um, because we wanted to keep it a secret. We did a lot of things. First of all, at its height, um, and again, this was not funding from police. This was funding from our partners. Um, as a matter of fact, state's attorney even helped us in these some of these arenas. Um, one, of the, one of the things, I'll say a couple of them. One of the things that we did was we went into the schools with the help of the now um, CEO of the schools. Um, it actually started before her, but it really took off when Dr. Santelis took over. And at the height, we were at 27 schools, elementary, middle, and high schools, 27 of them, where we had our officers in those schools, in the classroom, alongside of teachers, 
whether it was from first grade through 12th grade, the earlier you were, you were just learning basic good citizenry, how to obey your mom and dad, how to make great decisions, how to say no to certain things, how to say danger strange and all those things. But as you got older, you were starting to understand the language and the career and the and understanding would it be whether or not it'd be a good idea to take a career path into law enforcement. That was something that we fought for and had in school. The schools couldn't afford us to come in because it like like Nick is saying, they didn't have the money because it costs for these programs to come in. But we had we had other funders. We had nonprofits. We have charitable organizations that provide the funding. We had the Ravens and the Orioles. So we were able to get into these schools and these kids got firsthand mentoring from these police and their youth, Baltimore City Police and also school police. I need to mention that. And so that was a terrific program. But then finally, because of the lack of support, that fell away. But not only did those good kids, because most of them were great kids, but we could not ignore, uh, and I'm telling you the whole pendulum, because I can't say everything in between. But on the opposite end, we knew that were kids were not, not even coming to school. Kids who have failed once, twice, three times. What do we do with those kids who are coming from a failed environment? So we developed something called Love You Life Camp. And we literally took about 50 kids off every summer, two weeks before school started back up, took them offline, took them out of Baltimore City into the county, into the woods, deep into the woods. And we, being the police, Baltimore City police, school police, we had pastors, we had um, recs and parks, we had firemen, we had um, military personnel, we had, we had lay people from the community that just loved our youth and we all became counselors. That's all they knew us as. And they came in cussing and fussing and fighting because they were unruly. But by the end of that camp, they were transformed, wanted to get back in school, wanted to get jobs, didn't want to be bullies anymore, didn't want to live a life of crime anymore, didn't want to do drugs. They literally transformed their lives from Monday to Friday. And by Thursday night, that's when they found out we were police officers and it blew their minds. That's why we had to keep it a secret. We can't let that get out, so don't tell nobody. And everybody's watching this. If it ever come back, don't tell nobody. But anyway, what I'm saying to you is all of those things were never funded by or by funds that could have been reallocated and made so easy from the police department. They came from all those things I mentioned, like John Hopkins, the mayor's office provided things for us. Um, again, the state's attorney's office helped us out. And so unless we come in a collaborative form, we're not going to be able to really help our youth. Not one entity can do this by themselves. We have got to all say, you know what, the youth and everything else that makes up Baltimore has to be, what do I say, has to become a value to all of us. We can't turn a blind eye to it. And everybody's got to put skin in the game. Everybody. Because we can all make Baltimore a better place, especially for our young people. Because someday I'm going to be real old. I'm older than anybody on here right now. And I'll be sitting on my rocking chair and praying to God that somebody helped our young people and invested them enough that they become our future terrific leaders like you guys on here today. I think that you're making a lot of good points. And actually, I think I was a part of one of those um, recruitment trips, like where you get taken away um, for the week. And then at the end, the police are uh, revealed to you. I definitely remember going on one of those. And I do believe it was a good experience. So my question to you is um, being with your input and everything. So are you saying that instead of reallocating the money, we should keep it where it is and then just come make sure that the youth are included while we with the money that's um, in the police department, like, are you saying the money should stay there, but it should be um, put in some more youth related programs like it was in the past? Yeah, let me let me. Great question. Great question. And I remember I wasn't going to say anything. I remember you had to love your life. Kim. I won't go say nothing. But anyway, <laughs> let me say this. Um, uh, Josh, I get you saying let's just take 200 million. Um, so we can't come up with a rough number. Right. Just arbitrarily because there is a lot of real funding that has to go into the policing. So there have to be a real audit done with the police department, right? A real audit and figure out what's the real bottom dollar that would take to, for us to have a functional police department. And then with the funding that they do have, yes, what I'm saying is some of that funding has to be reallocated that we are good stewards over our money. It's just not for us. How can we better 
help our students, our young people, become better young people. By some of those things I talked about and a plethora of other things, camps and all kinds of things that we were funding, not we as police, but we had to beg and borrow for other entities like churches who saw the value in it. Well, if the police would just say, you know what, we need to be funding some of this with our, and I'm going to say it like this, inflated funding, some of this stuff we're, we're moving around and reallocating within our agency. And I'm going to be real transparent with you, so I may get in trouble. Really don't care. I'm retired right now. But we're reshifting and we're moving monies around, right? So it's not found out. But better yet, why don't we just take that money instead of hiding it or just saying that it belongs one place when it's just ghost money and just pour it into the community? Whether it's reentry programs, whether it's with our young people, with homelessness, whatever it is, there's something we can pour this money into instead of just sitting on it, hoping we can just keep it. So, yes, reallocate some of that funding. It's a lot of money to be reallocated. Uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, can community policing be funded by a combination of funding sources, or is it currently only under police department? Hey, Melvin, we miss you. Uh, I want to pose that question to our other panelists, if one of you guys want to start it. Sure, I mean, um, definitely, yes, um, to Christina's question. Um, you know, the city, the state, the federal government can always enter in something called private public partnerships, um, where institutions, organizations, foundations can help support certain services. Um, uh, right now, there are, um, you know, tons of different opportunities uh, where we see um, different organizations, different foundations that kind of support uh, municipal services. So, uh, from a community policing perspective, uh, that would be treated the same way. All right, uh, Miss B, I'm looking at your face right now. What are you thinking? Uh, uh, Divine. I'm sorry, you guys. My connection is going really slow right now, so it's a little leggy. But what was the question? I'm just like trying to catch up right now. Yeah, you're uh, you're good. We're talking about, you know, community policing and like if that could be funded, you know, by the state and by like from the police budget. If I remember the question correctly. So what do you think about, you know, community policing and how that could be funded? Um, well, one, I feel like it can be, um, I'm sorry, I don't want to answer the question until I fully, like, feel like I understand what community policing is. And that's a question for me, but I feel like it should also be a question for everybody who's watching, because maybe some people don't know what community so is. So, if, if I can help divine out a little bit, um, it's called community policing. So, yes, absolutely. Again, talking about skin of the game some of that funding should come from the police department. Again, I will tell you that the only division that didn't have funding, operational funding, um, was the community component of Baltimore police, right? Everything else has operation funding, whether it be homicide, narcotics, whatever, but not community. So community should have its own um, um, value wick of fundings, but because it's community policing, it's gotta be a collaboration. It's just not the police. Police can't community police without the, without the community, and the community can't expect it without being in partnership with the police. So it's a collaboration, which means other entities also have to put skin in the game. And that's what, when I was there, we had great partnerships around community policing with institutions like John Hopkins Hospital, with the Baltimore City School System, right? With the fire department, with the state's attorney's office. You heard Merlin talk about some of those wonderful things. Um, we did some collaboration on a few of those things she talked about. So what I'm saying to you is, Community policing, it can't, it just can't come from one pot. Community is what the entire city is, right? If you're a part of Baltimore, if you live, work, or play there, then you're part of that community. And whatever, whatever silo that you come out of, that silo should be able to funnel money into it. It should be a great melting pot of funding to create a great community for all of us. I hope that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. If i if I may add in, um, just to add on to the definition of community policing from what I've heard so far, I think 
that is basically when we have police or people from the department go back into the community and inform the youth, educate the youth, and just educate people more about their job and what they do. So if anyone was watching and was confused or to help you too, Devon, um, I just wanted to add my input on that. Well, I definitely understand a little bit more now. And the first thing that pops up into my head is why don't we, I know COVID-19 is something that's creating a barrier right now, but why don't we go to the community and why don't we do the actual footwork and do the actual one-on-one -on -one work with the community and ask them what they need? We go to the different organizations, the nonprofits, the people who are working with the people directly and ask them, what type of funding do you need? What are the things that you need to get done? What are the things that you are trying to do? We need to go out on the streets and ask the homeless people, how can we help you? We need to figure out what programs we can put other people in and figure out how we can create more programs. If we want to help the community, we have to go to the community to get the answers and we have to ask everyone in the community. And I definitely. I, I'm sorry. I just want to say one thing because um, I also see somebody. Her uh -huh. name is Aya Damon, and um, she is the co-founder of the Baltimore Safe Haven. And she says, "Fund grassroots orgs." And I feel like if anybody is watching right now who is a part of the community, please speak up. What do you guys want to be funded? Please speak up and tell us what you guys need. Let us know so it can get done. This is what we're having this for, so we can talk about it. Devon, yeah, there the is ain't one answer. But you're not to understand community policing at first. You you all know what happened, but you got to crash course in it because that's our problem. We want to build up programs and everything else, and there's great work being done in silos throughout Baltimore by some great people and great programs and nonprofits. But ain't nobody talking to them, and they need money. So you're absolutely right. We got to learn to listen to the community because they're living it every day, right? And figure out how we best help them doing the great work that they're doing. So it could and be also, fun. Chief, uh, one, of, one of the main issues, um, particularly with grassroots organizations, is building out capacity. It's kind of like for small businesses in our community, access to capital for organizations, it's building out capacity. Uh, and a lot of times what you'll see is from a foundation perspective, many of the larger uh, organizations um, that, some, that do great work, they get the boatload of the money. Uh, and then kind of the smaller organizations who actually are represented by the community, for the community, are in the community and like literally um, boots on the ground and for those different services, it's really hard for them uh, to go through the different processes. So, um, you know, the technical applications uh, and again, you know, getting access to your know, building out capacity. So I think that that's a really big thing and a problem uh, that we have in the city of Baltimore that needs to be fixed. Yeah, Jocelyn, I know you were saying something, so I wanna kind of pass it back to you to sort of pick that back up. Oh yeah, I definitely agree with what everyone is saying. And I also would like to go back with to what um, Devon was saying. Like it really does start with us as a people. We have to sort of make that decision like, okay, we need to do stuff. We need to get stuff done, see what the problem is and try to work on fixing it. And I feel like a great way to do that was like when we were talking about the funding. You said the police officers, they can't get the funding all the time. So with other organizations and charities around our city that can also pitch in, even doing charity events, fundraisers. Like I feel like if nonprofits, if they try to pitch in, um, you know, just bond with other organizations, I feel like that money together and even from other resources or other outlets, that is just a start by itself trying to get back to our community to see what we can do as people even though it might not make a drastic change like that, it would still be a start to how we can improve our environment. Yeah, um, I 100% agree with what you know, you're know you saying. And I think that all of this sort of comes back around to, there's not enough money being put into the community. And especially right now, I feel like, like the community is like we're being, like what like we're all saying, need to we need to like build the communities you know put money to them with these grants and with these fundraisers programs and like that going back to the eight million even from the very beginning if we put that you know into the communities that could even be a great start to them. Huh. 
how do we engage in reimagining investment in communities to prevent violence? Uh, well, I feel like it's just a thing of, you know, building them, you know? Like, it's sort of a weird question for me to answer. To, like, prevent violence is, I guess, make sure that their activities, you know, like for the students getting out of school, make sure that there are these, you no know, rec centers they can go to or like these programs after school. Like, you know, in school, like, for example, let's talk about schools for a little bit. And let's talk about how a school like Bard doesn't have any after school clubs at all. And that's the main reason, one of the main reasons I didn't go there is because, you know, I'm interested in theater. I'm interested, you know, in maybe even doing sports. Bard has none of that. Let's talk about BSA, no after school activities at all. And that's just two of them. I'm pretty sure there are plenty of them. Like, I know that, for example, Polly doesn't have like a real theater, you know, club or do any place or anything like that after school. So when it comes to like reimagining investment in communities to like prevent violence, it's making sure that there are things to do, you know, making sure that there's enough going on in the community to sway people away from violence. So I'm going to, I've said my piece and I want to pass it to anyone that wants to answer. The only thing that I guess I would, I would chime in and, and say is what we talked about before, reimagining what we're investing and in, in policing, right? I heard you just hear it over here. But the one thing I think that we should be doing is investing in those young folks and in these programs. And one of the things that we've done, at least out of my office, the usual sort of approach of a prosecutor's office is that you don't ever come in contact with the prosecutor until you've already made that poor decision, right? Like you've broken the law, been arrested, you've already kind of made a poor choice, and now you have to consequences. What we've attempted to do, at least in my under my center, was to create a crime control and prevention division that's dedicated to addressing and bringing the prison pipeline, right? So, like, even when we look at data uh, three years ago we started these baltimore state attorney and this is when you talk about chief russell and these partnerships with other organizations we partnered with the mayor's office and the police department and dtlr and private organizations to ensure when we look at the data there was a drastic increase in youth violence on friday nights between the hours of seven and nine and so we said how can we be proactive so that we can keep young people productive, right? And, and, and going down the right track. And so we started doing these events and create really recreational opportunities for young people. And we would feed them laser tag and bowling and skate night, you know, swimming pools. And so I think we have to be And as Chief Russell has already indicated, we have to do this from a partnership perspective. And it, it can't just be one agency by itself. But you guys are absolutely right. We have to figure out ways to prevent violence. So that again, we're doing this on the front end and not on the back end. And to just to, to piggyback off that, um, we know that poor communities experience more violence. You know, you're not going to show me an urban a community with concentrated amounts of poverty that does not have a tremendous amount of violence. And I say all that to say like you know, it's great and it's the things that we should be doing and we have to do. But until there's economic paradigm shifts in our community, until there's actual economic empowerment in our communities, uh, until we go and kind of recreate what's what's intentionally done to many of our communities through things like redlining, blockbusting um, and urban revitalization, um, it's really it's really tough to get in front of that. So while we're having the discussion about the programmatic and outreach and engagement uh, type of things. We also need to have the same uh, discussion around economic inclusion and economic empowerment in our communities. I feel like another way we can do it is focusing on rebuilding and making our community safety, safer places. We all know that anywhere you go that there's going to be a rough side of town or a street that you don't want to walk down how about 
instead of not walking down those streets or just ignoring them, instead of, you know, pushing out the black community and bringing in the white community into these rough neighborhoods when we rebuild them. How about we fix these neighborhoods? We make them safer places to live. We stop the gun violence and we make it a safer community to live in instead of trying to figure out what we're going to do with it. How about we actually go out there and do the work? Like I've said before, just go out and do the footwork, go out and see what's going on and realize what needs to be fixed. I would like to add on to that. I definitely agree. Um, with a part of that, you can put recreational recreation centers in those um, communities to give the people in them something to do and something to do with their time. And to go back to what the chief was saying, I think um, the camps and programs that used to recruit um, kids right before school, they, like the chief said, when you get that experience um, around so many mentors, you if that's a way to prevent violence, just giving the youth in the city something else to do, something positive to do around positive people. I think that's just a major way to prevent violence. And um, I think that those programs need to be active again um, because I think a lot of people may not know about them and to maybe connect them with schools and have schools put out word about them. Cause I'm sure a lot of people don't even really know what programs we're referring to. And that's a huge problem because they were so helpful and beneficial to so many students. And I remember so clearly my experience there. And I think that that's an experience a lot of um, youth deserve to have. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess you, you want to go off what um, Imani's saying, like basically when she's saying a lot of students don't know about these programs. I sort of experienced that with Greater Baltimore Urban League. I didn't know about it, but my mom introduced it to me. And I sort of feel like even if at school, you know, they have poster boards of like different clubs to go through. I feel like different nonprofit organizations like this would also be a good thing for students to be recruited for or just even be, you know, um, exposed to just because of like the fact of like what you can gain from it or the um, like the insight from these programs. And I also wanted to hit back on what the, um, the Mosby's were talking about, of how um, Miss Marilyn Mosby, she was saying like, just even like the outreach of getting students to do like activities such as skating or bowling. I feel like that's really important because it sort of caters to our youth today. Like they're gonna wanna be involved in things that they're gonna like rather than, I guess, you know, force whether like schooling or teaching techniques. I feel like getting them out and um, having them engage in activities that will, you know, cross like uh, pertain to them, that would be more like exciting for students to go through. And just the fact of like the redlining being brought up to like violence and all that, all that starts with that. Because even though those maps aren't there or still written down, redlining is still here, gentrification, that's still here. There are houses that have deeds from years ago only so that white people can live there. And sort of like you pushing, you're pushing African-Americans into these, uh, into these neighborhoods and environments with poverty and all that. So it's sort of like, it's just sort of already on that, um, it's already on that path. And it's sort of like, we have to fix that because we're just gonna put ourselves in the same situations where families have low income, Families have to keep catching buses because they can't afford to have a car to drive themselves to work or their children. Then their children go through that. And then it just becomes a whole cycle. And it's sort of like, like you said, like we have to put ourselves in that position to, you know, help better our youth and help improve and help get rid of the violence that is in our city. Yeah, I, I just want to say, if I can, I just want to say excellent, excellent point. Excellent point. Imani, excellent points, Divine, my goodness, and, and, and Nick, I mean, you guys are hitting the nail on the head. And I, I would just, let me be real simple when we talk about stopping the violence. Why not just go to the source of the violence? Yes, you can, you can investigate and arrest, but you're never going to arrest your way out of it. Why not get to the root cause by going to those who commit the violence and simply asking the question? Sounds so simplistic, it doesn't sound authentic or it doesn't sound realistic. Why are you doing this? And what can we do as a city, as a community, to help you to stop doing this? People say, oh, that'll never work. Well, it does work. 
I can't tell you how many now today gang members, former gang members, and some of them still trying to get their ways out, are now I consider my nephews and I consider my brothers and my sisters because we simply went and asked that question and we helped. I can't tell you how many people get out of the so-called gang and no longer commit violence, but now they got a trade, they're doing things, they're raising a family, helping get homes, getting the job training, did all those things because we did what Destiny's talking about. You simply ask the question, you go in the community, hey man, how can we help you stop this? Can I tell you, young people that are out here committing acts of violence, people in general who are committing acts of violence at the end of the day, and I heard somebody, I think it was you, Josh, it's just they're trying to survive. At the end of the day, that's all it is, survival. So can we get to the root cause by asking them, what's it going to take? Were you molested? Were you abused? Are you not eating? Are you trying to keep a roof over your head for your mom and little brothers and sisters? What is the reason? And then we roll up our sleeves, like Nick said, and we invest, start investing into those underserved, over-policed communities that almost nobody seems to pay attention to, and all they want to do is enforce and force, or just ignore them and watch the blight continue to grow. We could turn it around by simply going to them because they matter too. I don't care if they vote or not. They matter because they're part of the family called Baltimore City. And so I would just simply say, let us talk to our community members, like Destiny says, and say, what is it that you need that we can help you get back on your feet or get out of the situation that you're in? And you'll be surprised. And that's why even today, and I'll shut up with this, even today, this will be our fifth year, we do an annual um, turkey bowl, I'm sorry, unity bowl between police and gang members, police and gang members, because we simply came to the table together and said, how can we make each other's jobs and lives easier? Gang members say what they need. They need jobs. They need homes. They need drug rehabilitation. They need all these things, expungement. And the police said, we need you to stop selling drugs. We need you to stop robbing. And we started helping each other by fixing the problem and not just playing cops and robbers. I hope that makes sense to you. And Unity Bowl is a football uh, yeah. game. It's a flag football game that we do every Saturday before Thanksgiving over at Douglas High School. Yeah. Thank you for that. That was really great insight. Uh, I guess I just have one more question and this one will be more specifically for uh, Mr. and Mrs. Mosby. Um, with the conversation we've been having for the past you know, hour about investing into the communities and you know, making those changes, what changes you know, in the following months and years should we expect? I, I guess that's more of the question that I'm left with. What changes are we supposed to expect? So when you say changes, what types of changes? You mean in policing or changes overall? I mean, more just overall, overall, like in general, for the next few years of, you know, this city, of this state of Maryland, what are we supposed to expect? Based off of, I'm yeah, sorry, based, based off, off of the what conversation again, we, we've been having about investing into the community, like, I yeah. guess, what, what is the next step? What should you be advocating for? Well, um, this is what I, I tell folks. You know, right now we're in the midst of literally, literally a global pandemic, right? We're coming out of COVID, right? So, you know, the way um, revenue has been lost, the way the economy has been going, you know, we are really um, approaching some troubling times, um, not just in our individual homes, not just in private entities, we're seeing businesses going out of out of business, but then also in government, right? So I think the question, but but we're also at a very unique time where there's this uh, new wokeness about, around um, uh, Black Lives Matter, around ensuring that there is equity uh, throughout our communities, right? So I think that we're in a very uh, uh, interesting time because when crisis comes, there's nothing but opportunity that surrounds it, right? And it's really about taking advantage of that opportunity, taking that bull by the horn and really pushing for the issues. Um, I think that what we'll see is we're gonna see significant police reform. Um, I think um, that'll take place uh, not only in our city halls, but also in our state houses uh, where you're gonna see things like the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. We're gonna see things uh, looked at. You're gonna see things like um, universal uh, use of force uh, type of policies and procedures put in place. You're going to see, see folks push for independent investigatory agencies of police-involved crimes. Um, that's one. When we talk about other things moving forward, 
the General Assembly last year passed the Kerwin uh, uh, bill, um, which resets that fund, funding formula that I discussed earlier uh, to put more money in uh, communities like Baltimore City. So it's going to increase community schooling, uh, community schools. It's going to increase um, the type of resources we have in our schools, like psychiatrists and social workers. So that's another interesting fact. Um, unfortunately, Governor Larry Hogan vetoed that bill. Uh, hopefully, my colleagues in Annapolis will be able to override it once we go uh, back in session. Um, and then, you know, I hope to be the next president of Baltimore City Council. I'm the Democratic uh, nominee for the, the, the council president. Um, going back to this idea of like really reshifting the way uh, we look at economics in our communities. Again, we can continue to chase our tails around crime, around schooling, around homelessness, around all of these variables that we know um, do not um, uh, 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 equate to healthy uh, communities. Uh, or we can decide to ensure that we are empowering our communities through economics. And when we start to talk about that, uh, that's when we start to talk about developing real plans, sustainable plans of driving down crime, of increase in education. Okay, that was a very good answer. Thank you. I appreciate that from a city man. <laughs> uh, anyone else have any uh, thing they want to bring up to that point or anything they want to ask? I just want to highlight a comment I see on here, another great comment from Aya Damons. I'm going to read it out loud. It says, if a child has no meaning, parents strung, on, ugh, strung out on heroin, how does the, the kid survive the biggest cry for help? Is my youth on a corner who washing windows, LGBT community doing survival sex work, HIV positive by 15 and by 15 MSO, I'm sorry, that says, Miss Mosby, let's create a safe harbor law, bringing resources, education to our community, a turn around the division program. And I just wanna say a little bit more about that because I've actually spoke to Aya Damons about that and I love her idea for it. The safe harbor law is to create a, basically exactly what it is, a safe harbor for people who are out there at night and who are maybe, yes, be, um participating in survival sex work or who are out there, we all know the squeegee boys who are out there trying to wash windows to make money or kids who are getting put out of their houses. Maybe it's because they're gay or they're trans or maybe it's just because they're going through it and they're, they're black and they live in a bad neighborhood. Their parents don't really got it and they're on the streets now. I feel like we need to create a safe harbor law to support things like that. I've been saying it the whole live. Let's create things where people can go and get housing. Let's create things where, or fund things and fund people who are doing that. Let's make it to where people who are out on the streets are getting arrested for things. Let's make sure that they have a place to go, that they have food to eat, that they can somehow get a home no matter what. So, and I you're, um, you're reading the comment and your advocacy. And one of the things that I can tell you is that, you know, in addition to not having a traditional sort of um, prosecutor's office in the sense that we just prosecute crime, I have a policy and legislative affairs division where we go down and every year have a legislative and aggressive legislative agenda where we go and we advocate for state laws to change. But even besides all of that, one of the things that I think is incredibly important when we think about this moment, right? where you're seeing um, a number of black men who, and black women who are losing their lives over these minor, trivial sort of nuisance offenses. You know, we look at Eric Garner, who was allegedly selling a loose cigarette. You look at Sandra Bland, she failed to put on a, a turn signal and lost her life. You look at, you know, George Floyd, who is alleged to have passed a 20, a counterfeit $20 bill in a global groceries, right? So what I've come out and basically said is that we have to decrease engagement, that un the, the unnecessary sort of engagement where we are relying on the police department to always respond to every social ill, right? And so I came out and I basically, the state law hadn't changed. However, I said, I'm not prosecuting marijuana. I'm not, when we know that marijuana, there's no disparate use among white and black people 
the only thing that seems to be happening is that we're focusing on Tyrone and West Baltimore and not someone else in, in, in by John Thompson, right? The discriminatory enforcement. I've come out and basically said, I'm not prosecuting uh, prostitution. The laws haven't changed, but in the city of Baltimore, we are not prosecuting sex work in the, in the city of Baltimore, understanding the, the issues and, and concerns around it. I've come out and basically said, I've enumerated a number of crimes where I'm saying, guess what, police department, go ahead and, and waste your time on these trivial offenses because they're not going to be prosecuted. So I am very much committed to working to change the state laws, but I also understand and recognize that my power and my discretion can be used in ways in which um, I, I'm attempting to use that without the change in the laws. Thank you for that. Uh, Devin, any other comments that you want to bring up or anything else you want to say to that? Is it safe to position officer-friendly imagery to today's youth if officers exhibit behavior that isn't actually friendly? I would like to um, take a shot at this question, if I may. By all means. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that um, the behavior that we see by officers, that's not all um, of the officers. So I think that the mission of Officer Friendly was to kind of show officers in a positive light. So being that this comment um, is kind of looking at the negative side, I think that that's exactly why we should bring it back to show um, youth and just people that not all police are bad because when there was um, the program in the schools, it was just really positive. Like, although there is a lot of negative, negative police officers and a lot of negative activity around police officers, there are some police officers who have families too and who are dads and mothers and they have to look out and feed their families as well. So I think the mission, like I said, of Officer Friendly was to show that and to show that police officers are humans too, that they have um, positive sides too. So if anyone else wants to take a shot at the question, um, feel free. Yeah, I, I wanna talk about it. So I guess in a way, like children's TV and like cartoons and stuff is supposed to present a level of idealism and like a utopian society where like, you know, things are okay. And like, you know, obviously, you know, as you know, older kids and adults, we know that, you know, we know what's going on in the world and what's going on around us but you know as a kid you don't know that you know so i guess presenting that level of utopianism for them is okay and you know like imani was saying not every police officer is a bad person you know not every police officer one like has the intention of you know like murdering an innocent or unarmed person today and so I, like I think that you can I go think that, that i'm sorry um, yeah i just think that you know it is okay for you know officer friendly imagery in tv i kind of want to ask the question to uh chief russell a little bit like reading this as you know chief russell what comes to your mind Sorry, I had to unmute there. Couldn't find my little mousey. But um, listen, Imani, great, great points, as well as you, Josh. Listen, officer friendly, every police should be officer friendly, right? If you can't trust a police officer, my motto is, or my way of thinking is, um, who can you trust? That's not, that's, not, that's not a knock on anybody else. But when you think of certain professions, um, knowing that the police are out there 24-7, you should be able to trust them, not feel violated by them, but they should be in help. And an officer, when he when he takes that motto, you know, to protect and serve, when he swears to be an officer and upholds the law, he needs to understand that and remember that at all times, right? 
And, you know, I, I had a wake up call after working in narcotics for 20 years because I wasn't really engaged in the community as much, even though I was a part of it. My thing was just find the next drug dealer and disseminate and dismantle his organization. But I wasn't paying attention to the erosion between police and community. And when I came back out of narcotics into uniform, I was literally shocked by how police officers and communities were engaging each other or lack thereof. There was a visceral hatred towards one another on so many levels that wasn't there 20 years previous. And so I almost had to reach, not almost, I had to retrain the officers that worked for me, 130 cops, and say, this is how you treat your community. And I had to go to the community and say, listen, we respect you. Please respect us. And we had to get back. We almost had to blow up whatever they learned, unlearn that over the last couple of years and relearn. And so I had to teach my cops like things, keep changing your pocket, because unfortunately or fortunately, however you look at it, most of my career was spent in underserved communities, poverty communities, African-American communities, poor communities. And so lots of time there were single mothers struggling, raising their kids. They were going to the corner mom and pop store where prices were inflated and they were getting the necessary foods or products that they needed, but didn't have enough to get maybe just a bag of chips for the crying child who was screaming, I want chips. And so I taught my cops, keep changing your pocket. When you see them going to store walking behind them, because nine times out of 10, that child who now has a bad perception of police because of the erosion of years and the relationship we had, now look, they're afraid of police. Not They're just they're literally afraid of police. Not officer friendly, they're afraid of you. I can't tell you how many times when I got back in uniform, kids, small kids will cry and scream and run up for cover behind their mamas and their relatives because they saw me in uniform. Didn't know me, but they knew that uniform and it meant terror to them. So somehow they was traumatized. And so I said, look, we gotta start serving them again. So take your change out. Ask mom, can I buy a bag of chips? Can I get that soda? Can I get whatever for that child? And start sense changing the perception. Go into the schools, not for a call, but just to say hello, hang out with the kids. When you get a call for kids playing ball in the street, don't jump out and chase them. Hey, throw me the football, pass the ball to me. Let me take a couple of shots. And after a few minutes, then sit down and say, why you can't be banging on the cars because the people value their cars in this community. That's officer friendly. And we've gotten away from that, and we need to get back to that. Like Imani says, there are way more good officers than bad officers, but some of them just got so frustrated that they're just not doing the necessary things to continue to keep up that repertoire of we are all officer friendly. And we just need to get back to that. And with that, we need to help the community help us with that. Be patient with us. Be a little bit kinder to us, because we really do have a good soul. We are moms and dads and uncles and everything else under these uniforms. We were men and women and children and everything else before we became police officers. So that's enough said about that. And once again, and the one thing I will say, can I just add to Chief Russell? I think that you make a really great point about like this time we want to kind of jump on police and all police, but we got to think about this police officers. I come from four generations of police officers. My grandfather was a founding member of the first black police organization in Massachusetts. So the sacrifice that police are making in order to ensure our security is something that you cannot, it's, it's something that it, all of them, they do, they're committed to doing, they're risking their lives for us. And so not all police are bad, and there are gonna be in every profession, some bad apples. But I do think that when we talk about community policing, right, the one thing that I can appreciate about that is that, you know, growing up, I, I lived in what was called the police house, right? Because my mother and my father, my uncles, my grandfather, all of them were police officers. And I can remember they were like, oftentimes, kids from the community that would come to my house and you know we had a pool table so they would always there were always people at my house can remember just like walking in and people being hey cuz and I'm like I don't know you who are you right and so uh, I remember just my grandfather um he was like this paternal figure to the community and it's crazy because I was here in Baltimore about a year and a half ago and someone walked up to me in a, a coffee shop and said hey aren't, aren't you Marilyn Mosby I said yeah I am he said I just want to thank you I said thank me for what he said I want to thank you for Mr. T Mr. T is my grandfather he died a month after I was sworn in as state's attorney he said I would not be the man that I am today if it wasn't for your grandfather he 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 was there for me in a way that I didn't have parents to the, the, he was he was that paternal figure, not just to my family, but to our community. And that's I think 
That's what we need more of. We need more of Chief Russells like that are actually engaged in the community and are representing the community and understand the bigger sort of picture so that they are invested and not necessarily those that are, are not connected. And I would like to add on um, again, and it's not to paint a false picture to the youth that there's nothing going on. I think it's good to educate the youth on what's going on, but at the same time to share the positive too. Um, and as Miss Mosby said, um, bringing back Officer Friendly will be bringing back a friendly mentor and an, a person to look up to. So I think that would definitely be a... Um, a good thing to bring back, especially with everything going on now. Yeah, thank you, Imani. I want to pass it over to Jocelyn. Uh, what are you thinking? Is he? Is the chief speaking? I, I was just going to say to Imani's point, if it's okay, Josh, just real quick. Um, the community has a role or can have a role in creating officer friendly in their own community. I used to always ask the question of community members, um, how many officers that patrol your neighborhood, do you know? Because there's three of them. Do you know them by name? Not just by face, but do you know them by name? And most times people couldn't, if they were lucky, if they could name one of the officers because there just was no relationship there. There wasn't any talking. Um, you, it's not like when I grew up as a police officer, we were all from Baltimore City. You need to understand some dynamics that's happened that probably 80% of police officers now do not come from Baltimore City, have not grown up in the city. So in some sense of the, of the word, it's foreign to them. They didn't go to our schools. They didn't grow up in our neighborhoods. And so we as community members can help them feel more welcome. I know some people might say, man, I'm not helping them dudes feel more welcome. But I'm just telling you what I know. I'm telling you what works. You know what? When I first started policing, the community would give me bottles of waters. I would walk out of my car and I would walk because they were so friendly towards me. In the wintertime, they knew they knew me so well, they knew I didn't drink coffee. So when I was coming down the street, hey, Mel, you want some hot cocoa? And I said, yes. You know, I didn't have to run to the bathroom at the police station. I went to the homes of the residents. I could literally walk indoors of the home of the residents in underprivileged neighborhoods and just walk in. I didn't have to knock because the relationship was so rich. Try to walk in now as a police officer in somebody's home and you ain't got a warrant. It ain't happening, right? So we got to get back and making each other feel safe and comfortable, right? I, to this day, when I'm in Baltimore City, not even being a police, if I see a cookout, and I did this all the time when I was working, if I saw a cookout or somebody barbecuing, Man, it was nothing for me to roll over. I don't care if it was two people or 200 people. And I say, hey, you think I can get one of them hot dogs? You think I can get one of them hamburgers? Can I get something to drink? And everybody will laugh and giggle and say, oh, man, come on in here. I sit on the stoops. I hang out with them. I became personable. And we got to learn to do that. But the community can help us by welcoming us into their world. Welcome them in by being nice to the police officer, even if he's the nastiest son of a gun. Most of the time, if he is nasty, that one that you might have is because he's just afraid and it's just an aura he's putting on. Break down those walls and just be nice to him. Listen, I'm also a persistent pastor, and I know this. You can kill meanness by just being kind to somebody. Keep on heaping on kindness to them, and after a while, it breaks down, and all of a sudden, you'll see a goodly person emerge. So I just wanted to add that. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, wait. You can go, Jocelyn. <laughs> But yeah, I definitely like the point that you made on the kindness thing, because all it takes some time is kindness. And um, also wanted to go on the fact of the officer friendly. I sort of wish I had that in my school because like of like, you know, a lot of students don't really have that opportunity. And we had police officers in our um, well, in my high school and one specific police officer. His name is Mr. O.T. And like he's a really good role model. A lot of students, you know, they really um. They communicate well with him. He understands the students. So I feel like, I guess that type of um, outreach between our school and a police officer, that would do well also. So if anyone else has like police officers in their schools that, you know, have a good connection with the students. Well, if there's any closing remarks or comments that any of the panelists would like to add, this is your time to do so. I was just going to speak up real quick and say, first and foremost, uh, to Greater Baltimore Urban League, thank you for this thank opportunity. Uh, more importantly, thank you for allowing young folks to participate. Young folks, what I will tell you is change always has been began in history. The young folks, um, your, your, your opinions, your experiences, your perspectives are truly, truly valuable.
how we move our city in a different uh, trajectory, then I'll ask that you continue to do this. It's important to have get your, your, your young folks and your, your, your contemporaries in group. Thank you for, for excellent questions and thank you for a great discussion. And thank you. I, I have to echo the same sentiments. Every great movement towards progress in this country began with young people just like yourself. And I am so incredibly proud of the young people that are getting out here and marching and standing up and protesting what's happening in this country and institutionalized racism, right? We're talking about issues that for far too long in this country, nobody was willing to address. And it has everything to do with the fact that you all are now holding people to account. And so I'm incredibly proud to be here with each and every one of you. And you even thought to bring me and, and Nick on. Um, so again, we're here for you. We support you, understand and recognize your own power because it's there. Um, and we're here to support you. Thank you. Well, of course, the Mosby took everything I wanted to say, but that's okay because I love him so much. So I don't have to repeat it. So that saves me a lot of time. So I'll just add this, that First of all, I am so incredibly impressed and proud of all of you. Um, know your voice, beautiful young people. Know your voice, know your power, and the power of influence that you have. We are civil and elected servants that work for you. And one of the recurring things that I heard over and over again is officer friendly, officer friendly. It sounds like everybody went officer friendly. Listen, we work for you. You know, you go to your elected officials, you go to your civil servants and say, you go to your school superintendent and say, we want officer friendly in our schools. It sounds like y'all want them. I don't know, but if that's the general consensus, understand what you want. Use, use your voice. I love our activists today. I love protesters today. Um, Merlin and Nick know this. I, I miss our days of enough is enough, and I, I miss our days of walking with the protesters. I miss all those days. We had some wonderful times out there. And just to be around the energy and the power that young people carry, don't lose that. We need you. Our noun depends on you. Forget about tomorrow for a second, because tomorrow's not uh, promised. But right now depends on the decisions you make. So Imani and Josh and Destiny and Josh and Josh, make continue and continue to make those great decisions that I'm hearing you um, express today. We love you. God bless you. And thank you again, like Merlin said, for even considering us to come on to this, because this is your platform. and You allowed us to come in as guests. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love you to life. It's quiet, so it must be my turn. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank everybody for um just coming out and participating. I wanted to thank one of the panelists. I really enjoyed having a conversation with you guys and just hearing the different insights and the different opinions. I also want to thank the audience. You guys were amazing. Just seeing the different comments and how interactive you guys were. <laughs> We will now have um, President Majors come in and share some final thoughts. Oh, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Uh, again, this is definitely in another powerful and amazing evening with our very, very um, energetic advocates, activists, um, Josh, Jocelyn, Imani, and our new divine um, that we, we just you know, they, they are definitely the voice of um, voice of our culture and the voice of Baltimore. Um, I, I was so thrilled to be able to book uh, Baltimore's best couple, um, our role models, um, the, the two that fight for the city, fight for us. We can go to them for everything and they have our back. So I'm so appreciative that every time I call, I, I, I try to be professional and I send an email and then I follow up with a text. I'm like, y'all, please. Um, so we are very, very grateful to have you all um, out of your time. My, my favorite top cop, um, I watch you from afar for many, many years and you did many amazing things in Baltimore. We miss you dearly. And, and I'm praying for the day that you come back that way or in another capacity, but definitely to grace us with your blessings and your understanding and compassion for the city. Um, we're grateful for it this evening. So 
Again, I thank you all. I thank you for your support of the youth. Um, these youth are definitely our future. They're leading the way. You know, when we have these town hall conversations about what's important, it's time for the adults um, to lay back and listen. You know, they, they're screaming even more so while we're in this pandemic. And they have the platform and they just want to be heard. They want to be a part of a great movement. And they've shown you this evening that they have. Um, I wanted to say that we have our survey again for anyone or any student that fills out the survey. You have an opportunity to win a $150 Visa gift card. So please make sure you fill out the survey. Uh, we ask you to tune in for our our next kickback, which is going to be um, HBCUs or PWIs, and some um, individuals PWI is a predominantly white institution, um, and we're going to have that kick off as we are going remotely with school as well as um, as well as college. So I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, I don't think I missed anything. I feel like I'm missing something, but if not, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Divine. I will speak with you guys again later. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.